Good morning. Hey, everybody, why don't you make your way into the seats and we will get started. All right, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all safe and sound. So snowy outside. We are here to worship the Lord Jesus together and uh, we're excited to be able to be the family of God together. Um, I wanted to start us out by reading a devotional that I have been reading. It's uh, on hope. So this is from Paul David Tripp. It's a, it's a devotional I'm reading, um, but I wanted to just, uh, it reminded me of some really important truths, and I wanted to start us out with that this morning. If you pay attention and listen carefully to what you and the people around you are saying, you will realize that we are hope-obsessed. Day after day, the things we do are fueled by hope. Little third grader Sally says to her mom as she gets ready for school, I sure hope the girls at school like me. Mom thinks to herself that day, I hope our marriage gets better. Teenager Tim says to his buddy, I've got a new job after school, I hope it's decent. Dad worries in the hope that he won't be one of the guys who's caught in the downsizing that his corporation is doing. From hoping that a certain meal will be good to hoping that we will have the moral strength to do the things we should do, our lives are fueled and directed by hope. What we're all searching for is hope that won't disappoint us, that won't leave us hopeless in the end, and we all want to convince ourselves that what we have placed our hope in will deliver. What are you asking of something when you place your hope in it? You're asking it to give you peace of heart. You're asking it to give your life meaning. You're asking it to give you purpose and direction. You're asking it to give you a reason to continue. You're asking it to help you through the difficulty and the disappointment. You're asking it to free you from envy or anxiety. You're asking it to give you joy in the morning and rest at night. Now that's a lot to ask of anything. That fact confronts you with this reality. If your hope disappoints you, it's because it's the wrong hope. Romans 5, 1 through 5, talks about a hope that won't disappoint you even in times of suffering. Maybe you're thinking, where can I find that hope? Sturdy hope that does not vanish with the constant changes in situations, locations, and relationships that make up all of our lives. Hope that simply will never, ever disappoint us can be found in only one place. It is not found in a certain thing, it is in fact a person, Jesus. Whether you've realized it or not, he is what your hoping heart has been searching for. Because what you've really been searching for is life, real heart-changing, heart-satisfying life, life to the fullest, life abundant. People can love and respect you, but they can't give you life. Situations can make your life easier, but they can't give you life. Locations can bring some changes to your life, but they can't give you life. Achievements can be temporarily satisfying, but they can't give you life. True, lasting hope is never found horizontally. It's only ever found vertically at the feet of the Messiah, the one who has hope. Place your hopeful heart in his hands today. Um, and the verse that I was reminded of was 1 Corinthians 15, 22, which says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And that's the hope that we have, um, that Jesus, the new Adam, the perfect Adam, is able to give us real hope that won't disappoint us. So as we pray together and as we worship and uh, sing praises to our God, let's keep that in mind and uh, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together. Um, 
in past times, people gathered together um, in fear and in some anxiety that uh, their actions were illegal. And in fact, that is happening in many countries in the world, uh, even this day. And uh, many of our brothers and sisters in Christ are, though it's hard, though there is fear that they will be found out by the authorities, they still gather and they still worship your name and seek you. And we, we, along with them, just unite our hearts and voices in praise to you and thanksgiving for giving us a hope that will not disappoint and giving us abundant life. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Help us to worship you this morning and to look to you. In, in your name we pray, amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Let's give the Lord praise and glory. I love that verse in the Bible that, that talks about this. It says, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin. He never had an evil thought, but God made him become sin at the cross. So even though he never lied, he became guilty of every lie that had ever been told, ever. And uh, he never had an evil thought. He never stole. He never... Uh, commit or false witness against a neighbor. He never sinned in any way, but he became guilty of all those sins willfully so that we could be saved. That's the amazing grace. And then God credits to the believer in Christ his righteous life. It's truly something that we can honor him for here today and praise him for. How can we say thank you for this? Sing with me. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, his free. child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me.
Thank you. Amen. Praise his name. Lord, we want to thank you this morning for adopting us into your family. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. And through him, we are your children. We're sons and daughters of the King. And thank you that that's who you say we are. And we, we give you praise today as our God. How can we say thanks enough, Lord? We've gathered on this snowy winter morning to honor your name and to give you thanks. And would you bless the people that have come, those maybe perhaps who are going to watch this online later. God, draw us into your presence. Encourage your people and strengthen us as we worship you and turn to you in this time of worship. Thanks for everyone who's here. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, good morning again, everybody. Just a couple of announcements. We are, Anna, can you advance to the announcement side? There's a couple opportunities for prayer, which would be awesome for you guys if you can partake in those listed up there on the screen, the ones that are coming up, um, especially since we're going to be talking about prayer this morning in the message. So take advantage of those opportunities um, if you're able to. Um, join others in prayer. It's very encouraging when the body of Christ gets together to pray, specifically to seek God. Um, so take advantage of those. Also, um, next slide. Members meeting, February 6th is coming up. If you're a member here at Westside Alliance, please plan to be there. Um, we are going to make that a opportunity to look back as a church family and to look forward at, um, and just see what God is doing among us. So please plan to be there. Next slide. Okay, so we want to have a send-off for the Gearhearts. They're not here this morning, but um, they're going to be with us up through the end of this month. So Mike and Wendy, Cole and Ivy, on the 30th, after the uh, worship service, we're going to have a get-together time, and uh, lunch is going to be provided and just an opportunity to talk with them and, and ask questions, um, just express love, express uh, support for what God's doing in their life. So plan to be there for that. Um, we're, we're hoping that it'll just be a really encouraging time for them, um, but also for us just to connect and, uh, and to say goodbye in, in one way, in one sense. Um, but of course, as believers, uh, we don't ever have to say goodbye in the final sense, but um, we want to make that opportunity available to us as a church family. Okay, next, children's ministries update. Um, I guess I will take the opportunity right now to officially welcome my wife, Joy Heiberger, onto staff uh, here as the interim children's ministries um, person. And she'll be coordinating and directing children's ministries here on Sunday mornings. Um, so connect with her and uh, welcome her. And, um, and if you have questions, feel free to talk to her and reach out to her. Okay, next slide. 40 days of prayer. If you haven't signed up for that, feel free to, you can still contact Wendy and ask for help signing up for that. She's still available through email and whatnot. But um, you can also sign up through the link that you should receive um, every week through the church email newsletter. So feel free to sign up for that. That is a uh, alliance denomination that we're a part of, wide event focusing on prayer. Um, so check that out. Okay, next slide. Is that it? Okay, last um, announcement is if you have a specific prayer request, um, feel free to write it down on the 
welcome card in front of you, and we'd love to be able to pray for you um, regarding that um, throughout the week as staff. So please feel free to write down your prayer requests. And um, Debbie, is it okay if I share your news? I wanted to ask you. Is that okay? Okay. So I just wanted you all to uh, know that William, Debbie's father, passed away this past week. And just uh, encourage her, pray for her. She goes down to Georgia this week um, for the memorial service. And um, yeah, we'll pray right now as we lead back into singing and, and worship. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for our sister Debbie and for just the fact that her father knew you and was a part of her coming to know you. Um, thank you so much for that legacy of passing faith down um, to children and having it continue on. Um, it brings you glory, Lord. And I thank you for all of us who can say we have experienced that as well. Um, so please comfort Debbie and uh, just pave her way down there without any obstruction. Help her to be able to get down there and to really have a blessed time with her family um, as they celebrate her father's life. And as we uh, worship, Lord, continue to help us see you better and to give you glory in our own hearts and lives and um, take away, um, or I guess show us, Lord, what, what needs to be surrendered to you in our lives that might be striving to take your place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue worshiping Jesus together. Amen. Let's stand and let's thank the Lord for his faithfulness. Great is 
your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. You've never failed me yet. I never will forget. You've never failed me yet. I never will forget. Thank you, Lord. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever. Yeah. 
strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Great so faithful to us. Praise his name. Are we dismissing kids today? We are. Okay. Kids, go ahead and be dismissed. Thank you for being part of our worship. We so just love having you here. Praise the Lord. And the rest of you may be seated. Kids can be dismissed. Thank you for being at worship today. If you came on a, a snowmobile or horse-drawn carriage or however you got here today, thank you for being here to honor the Lord. I think most of you know I'm Jim, and I'm very thankful to be with you in these days that... Uh, God is with us, and I want to talk to you about something. We've been doing a series on foundations, but before I talk to you, I just want to introduce you to somebody. Um, I brought a picture of my brother-in-law, Jimmy. This is Jimmy. I want to uh, introduce you to Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy is my wife's brother, my brother-in-law, although he uh, never liked the title brother-in-law. He didn't like the in-law part. We were just brothers. And uh, Jimmy had a difficult life. Obviously, you can tell he had Down syndrome, uh, ear surgeries, poor eyesight, diabetes, later in his life, kidney failure, dialysis, and he passed away about seven years ago, went to be with the Lord um, at the age of 52. But I want to tell you, Jimmy led a blessed life, a really blessed life. And here's a picture of Jimmy in, in one of our family gatherings. In fact, this was Mother's Day, and he had an annual uh, mother ceremony. So you can see him holding some cards there. That was for the mother of the year, the first runner-up, second runner-up. Uh, our family got a lot of laughs because uh, his mother only won once in all the years. His, I, I used to say, Jimmy, you have to let your mother win, you know, and he said to me, I, I, I can't control that. Like, he doesn't... Like, <laughs> I, he's not doing the whole thing, but he's like, I can't control that. No, Jimmy, you have to let your mother win. So he was full of life. He was full of love. He, was, he had a quick wit. Uh, and he touched our lives in so, so many ways. But the main reason I'm introducing you today to Jimmy is for a specific reason. Jimmy loved the Lord. He had a simple faith. He didn't understand uh, reformed theology as opposed to other theologies. He didn't understand uh, penal substitutionary atonement. He didn't understand all the theology. But Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Jimmy had a strong faith. And he loved to sing and worship. So it was common whenever we got in the car, he would just say to me, let's sing. And we'd start singing, going down the road, and we were quite a sight. Now, Jimmy could not sing a lick. He had the worst voice. He, he couldn't carry a tune if he had four buckets. He just, but he sang his heart out. 
And he loved victory in Jesus. Oh, victory! That's what it sounded like. Yeah, Jesus, my Savior! That's what it sounded like. And we get to the end of the song. He plunged me to victory beneath his cleansing uh, flood. And he'd say, V-I-C-T-O-R-Y. We always had to do this victory call at the end of it. And Jimmy loved to pray. And I'm going to share just a couple of things from Jimmy's life that encourage me about prayer. And I hope it encourages you too. Because that's what we're going to turn to today. The foundation of prayer is what we're talking about today. We're in this series called Foundations, and as we talk about prayer, we, we know that, first of all, this is such an important topic that it's one of the core values of, of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Uh, the Christian Missionary Alliance has this core value. Prayer is the primary work of God's people. Prayer is the primary work of God's people. Now, I want to get the elephant out of the room right now. I am not here today to lay any guilt trips on you or me about your prayer life or how much you pray. I think it's, uh, could we just agree at the beginning of this message that all of us should and could pray more? Okay, can we just get that out on the table? I'm not going to uh, lay guilt trips on you about that. But I'm also very much hoping that this message will be an encouragement to you, a blessing to you. And it will encourage us to do just that, to pray more, to seek God more, and to turn to him more. So I just want to pray for us as we begin, okay? Father, I want to thank you for even what I'm doing right now, the ability to talk with you and know that you hear what I'm saying. And not only that, not only do you hear it, but you want to draw near to me as I do that, draw near to all of us here this morning. I pray that the, inf the message today would not just be pouring out more information, but I pray it would be something that, that would encourage all of us to seek you more and that we would understand in a new and a fresh way just how important it is to, and foundational it is to talk with you and seek you and depend upon you. Encourage the people today, bless them, use this message toward that end. I ask it in your name that you might be glorified. Amen. Amen. I just want to outline for you, just as we begin, I'm going to just uh, do a, <laughs> whenever a pastor says he's going to go through the whole Bible, uh, I'm going to go through the foundation of prayer as it's seen throughout the scriptures, okay, from beginning to end. I'm going to do that quickly, okay? That's not going to take all day. But I want to lay a foundation that prayer is foundational, you can't uh, read a Bible and, and say, uh, you, you can't pick up how foundational prayer is in the life of all seasons, all saints throughout all of history, and even into the future, it's going to be important. Uh, and then I'm going to just close with a story uh, that's found in Bible in Acts 10. We're going to end in Acts chapter 10. A powerful story, I think, that demonstrates the importance of praying, and we're going to look at that together. First of all, I want to just show you throughout the Bible, in the very first mention of prayer in the Bible is in the book of Genesis chapter 4. It says, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. People began to call on the name of the Lord. This is uh, not long, uh, just a couple generations after uh, Cain had raised up and killed his brother Abel. There's a remnant of people who began to call out to God in worship to call upon him, to pray to him. I don't know what the, the Bible doesn't expound on, what that was about, what caused them to want to reach out to God, but they began to call upon him. You see the same thing in the life of Abraham. Years later, uh, God calls Abraham to leave, go to the land of Canaan. When he gets there, it says, Abraham built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. There you see it again. Abraham called on God. He turned to God. He worshiped him. And then Moses, years later after uh, Abraham, Moses said, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? Do you see this was the distinguishing factor between uh, the nation of Israel and all other nations? They called upon Yahweh. And when they called upon him, Moses says, what nation has a God like Yahweh that when we call to him, he draws near to us. He moves on our behalf. 
He delivered them from the bondage of Egypt. Prayer is that pathway to the very presence of God. God says, draw near to me, and what's the promise? I will draw near to you, says the Lord. Draw near to me, I will draw near to you. That's prayer. One of the most moving prayers in the Bible is found in the book of Samuel, years later, and uh, by a woman named Hannah. It's one of the most moving. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She was facing infertility, and it was just breaking her, and she cried out to the Lord. She came to the uh, temple, and she started to pray. It says this, as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli, the priest, observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Listen to this. Only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman, and Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. See, that's real prayer. It's not this written, formal, not that there's any, never any value in writing out a prayer. I'm not saying that. But prayer is something, it's a heart that cries out to, oh God, please help me. God, I need you. God, please, if you don't come, it's that kind of spirit. That's prayer. David knew about this. He said in Psalm 4, verse 3, but know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. This is fun. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God hears you when you call out to him? He wrote in Psalm 116, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. I'll keep doing it. I'm going to keep calling on God. He heard me. I love that picture. God doesn't have a physical ear, of course. <laughs> but David says, he turned his ear toward me to listen. In other words, I was calling out to him. And he was not deaf to my cry. God will not be deaf to your cries either if you call out to him like that. Let's keep moving through the Old Testament. The Daniel prophet is in exile. King Darius has signed this edict. You remember the story that no one can seek any god or petition any other god or man other than the king for 30 days. And this is what Daniel does. Daniel 6, verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem, he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Didn't matter. King's edict, I don't care. I'm seeking my God. I'm going to thank him. I'm going to call upon him. After the exile had ended, a remnant of, of some of the Jewish people came back to Jerusalem. If you know your history of the Old Testament, uh, Nehemiah is serving as a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes at the time. And uh, right, he, he hears that there are the exiles that have gone back are really struggling, having a rough time. He starts pouring out his heart to God. It's troubling him so much. And he wants to seek the king so he can go and help the effort. But he's afraid if he approaches the king that it would seem to the king that that he's dissatisfied somehow with the king. He could actually lose his life if you, put, if you rub the king the wrong way in those days. And so he goes in and talks to Nehemiah, excuse me, Nehemiah talks to the king, and he says, then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. <laughs> I love this. He didn't, he's talking, he's in a conversation with the king. I don't think he said, okay, wait just a second, king, I'm going to pray right now. I think just in his heart, when the king says, what do you want? He's, he, in his heart, he just started whispering, in his mind, in his heart, oh God, help me, help me, God. Help me with what I'm about to, you know. Just quickly, he prayed. And then he said, if it pleases the king, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I might rebuild it. I think this is what the Bible means when it says pray without ceasing. It's just throughout the day, you're, you're just always turning to God with something. Always, always, you know, Nehemiah was just in the midst of life and he needed God in that moment. And he just called out to him before as he's talking to the king. I told you about my brother-in-law, Jimmy, how he loved to pray. 
Jimmy's prayers were always uh, very simple, but very direct. Didn't have any of the uh, kind of the prayer cliches that we all have sometimes when we pray. Not that, listen, God hears us. I'll give you an example. He had a, uh, I told you he was on dialysis. He had a, they call it a fistula. I'm not a doctor, son of a doctor. I don't know all about these things. But something in the vein they had rerouted somehow so that, that the, the ports for the dialysis. Well, occasionally those, that vein would close up and they couldn't do the dialysis well. So he had to go, it seemed like about twice a year, sometimes three times a year. He would have to go to a specialist, have a balloon procedure done. And I remember I would always drive him, of course, and, and his mom who took care of him up into her 90s. Um, but I would drive him. And I remember we were trying to reassure him, and then we'd try, we'd try to distract him, you know, of what's good, you know. And, we would be talking, and all of a sudden, he never said something like, Jim, can we pray? Or, I need to pray, or I think I'm going to pray now. No. And just out of the blue, Lord, I scared. Would you help me? Don't think you have to be sophisticated in your praying. Don't feel like, don't be intimidated by us preacher types who seem to have all the right words in the right form. And That's not what God looks at. It's like whenever I was in a moment like that, I, I knew I was in a holy moment where a human being was touching the heart of God and God was helping him. Friends, we can pray like that anytime, anywhere. Just a heartfelt prayer. God, I'm scared. God, I need you. God, I don't know what to do. God, help me to do the right thing. God, give me wisdom. God, I'm discouraged. God, whatever. God will hear us. Jesus, of course, often prayed, didn't he, when he was on earth and he walked among us. It says, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he, Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Jesus often went lonely places and prayed. And this had a deep impact on his disciples. And they said to Jesus one day, Lord, teach us to pray like you pray. Isn't that interesting? They were with him all the time. They saw him do miracles. They saw him... Uh, exercised demons from people. He saw them He saw them preach and so forth. They never said, Lord, teach us to preach like you do. We'd love to know how to preach and tell stories like you do. Now, that's important, you know, but teach us to pray. They wanted to know how to pray. In fact, Jesus was so passionate about prayer and his dependence on God, and there's mystery on this. He's fully God, yet he's fully human, and in his humanity, he must depend upon the Spirit-filled life that, that we are to live. But he was so passionate about prayer, he did something so out of character, it would seem. When he went into the temple and, it, and uh, he started to throw out and drive out the money changers and over... Can you imagine Jesus like in a religious setting coming in and overturning tables and getting a, a cord with a... Get out of here! Get out of here! Sending and they're just causing mass chaos to the money changers who were there to provide the right currency that you could use for the offering for the Passover. So they were there for religious purposes. He says, "Get out of here." He says, "It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers." Quoting Isaiah 56. My house, God says, shall be a house of prayer. In other words, there is to be in the church and in our personal lives an atmosphere of prayer, an atmosphere of dependence, a turning to God. This is primary. This isn't secondary. This, uh, I love that we were able to worship. I love that you're listening to preaching today. These things are important. But you know what? If you don't connect with God, What are we doing? Seriously, if you don't have a connection with God, if you're not reaching out to him, even this morning, 
and, and pouring your heart out to Him and even praying in your spirit or, or seeking Him as God. This is what it, that's the atmosphere of the church. We're seeking Him. We're turning to Him. We're calling upon Him. We're asking Him for His help. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? In other words, Jesus was speaking about the atmosphere of the Old Testament temple, that it was to have an atmosphere of prayer to it. But we are likened to temples, right, in the New Covenant. We are, this Holy Spirit lives within us, and we're the temple, and therefore we're to have the atmosphere of prayer. Just a couple more. Uh, the early church, uh, was, prayer was foundational. Acts 2.42 says, They, the early church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were devoted to these things. Dan's going to pick up this verse next week as he preaches and continues on. And listen, as they prayed, God worked. Listen to me. When they prayed, God worked. And Acts 11, speaking of the church at Antioch, says the Lord's hand was with them. In other words, his powerful hand, his power was with them as they prayed, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. I don't know about you, but I, I want that hand thing. <laughs> Whatever that hand of God was that they had in the early church, we need that. We, we need that now. We need that here at Westside. And I believe God will help us. And I believe he will move his hand here. Why wouldn't he? Has he changed? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still responds to people who turn to him in faith and call upon him. And he's going to do it again. We sang it. I believe you'll do it again. You'll make a way. You'll do it again, God, because that's who you are. There was a 19th century British missionary to China for 51 years. His name was Hudson Taylor. He, he just wrote this. He said, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. I like that. When we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. He moves his hand. There's several New Testament. I just wrapped this section up with this. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, Philippians 4, 6. Paul writes to the Colossians, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Westside family, would you be steadfast in prayer? Would you continue to pray? Don't give up praying. To Timothy, he said, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. First of all, I want you to pray. Before you consider what kind of services you have, what your meetings look like in the homes that they were meeting in, I want you to pray. This is primary. And here's one that we don't think of. This is Revelation 5, verse 8. John gets this glimpse of the worship in heaven and it says that in heaven, as they're worshiping, there are golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints were represented in this vision as a, bowl of, a golden bowl filled with incense, this aroma that's pleasing to God. How precious is that? That our prayers are like a fragrance before God. It's a fragrance before Him. He's pleased with it. He hears you. Okay, so let's get to the example that I hope encourages you as we, as we wind down today. In Acts chapter 10, I want, us, I want you to see this lived out, played out, practically. It, Acts chapter 10 is a story about two men whose backgrounds could not be farther apart. The one character is Peter, the Jewish apostle of the, G, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The other is a Roman centurion. Totally different backgrounds. A Jew, a Gentile. Uh, one who's historically been part of God's people. One who has historically not been a part of God's people. And their lives are going to intersect in Acts chapter 10. And God put it in the Bible to, I believe, encourage us. And to show us that when he wants to do a work, he's going to use people who are praying to accomplish it. Okay? 
So look, let's look at it together. Acts chapter 10, verse 1 says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. So he's not your average uh, Roman centurion. Okay, we'll talk about that. But listen, he prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror. <laughs> a commander of Roman soldiers. In, in terror at the presence of this angel vision from God. What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers, listen, and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Jesus. Okay? So here he is. He's a worshiper of the God of the Jews. He hadn't fully, they, they're called God-fearers. They hadn't fully converted to Judaism, but he's a God-fearer. He's praying to the God uh, of the Jews. And God has heard this. He's been praying continually. And listen, as he was praying, he received direction from God. And I just want to say this to you. People who pray will receive direction from the Lord. People who pray will receive direction from the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Pray to him. Turn to him. And what will he do? He will make his, your path straight. He will help you. He will give you guidance. Okay, so he sends the men to Joppa to, to bring Simon Peter back, okay? So now look at the, as the three men are on their way, this 30-mile journey down uh, to Joppa from Caesarea, let's look at what's going on in Peter's life. Look at verse 9. The next day, as they, the three who had been sent by the centurion, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour, noon, to pray. <laughs> He's going up to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord. By the way, <laughs> that's a, that's, you ever see the irony in saying something like that? By no means, Lord. You tell me to do something. Oh, by no means, Lord. <laughs> but what he's thinking is this. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. See, those things that were on that sheet were ceremonially unclean for them to eat. And so Peter's saying, Lord, I can't do that. Those things are unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and the thing was taking up, taken up at once to heaven. And so he's starting to ponder this. And just as he does, verse 19, the three men show up at his house. Verse 19 says, And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of, uh, by the whole Jewish nation was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. Peter realizes something's going on here. I just got three Gentiles knocking on my door. I'm not even supposed to be associating with them. 
But God says, you, you associate with them because I'm working in them. And I'm calling them to myself just like I called you to myself. Well, Peter obeys the Lord. And he goes with the men the next day to meet Cornelius. Verse 23b says, The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa come. So now you've got some Jewish guys and some Gentile guys all heading together up to meet this Gentile soldier. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Verse 27, And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered, and he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And I'll let you go ahead and read the rest of the story sometime, but I think you know how it ends. Peter tells them about Jesus. He says he's Lord of all. He, we were witnesses of all he did, his miracles, his healing, all of his teaching. He was crucified for our sins, but yet God raised him from the dead. We saw him alive after his resurrection. And then he said, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter is still saying these things, there's a Gentile Pentecost, just like there was a Jewish Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Cornelius and all who were with him believed in the Lord. They were saved from their sins. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they were baptized. Wow. This application, as we close, listen to this. When God wanted to fulfill his promise of salvation to the Gentiles, he chose to accomplish his work through two men who were praying. Okay? What if Cornelius was not praying to God? I'm just asking a question. What, what if he never prayed? I don't think... I, now, God's going to do what he's going to do. He's going to find people to do what he wants to do, and he's going to work how he's going to... But I think somebody else would have had that blessing. What if Peter had never been praying? What if West Side Church, what if we never pray about things that we need to pray about? Isn't it, one of the most tragic verses in the Bible is, you have not because you ask not. That's tragic. I'm encouraging you, here's two men who were praying and God moved on their behalf. He he, he, Peter would not have gone to Cornelius' home. He probably wouldn't have reached out to Gentiles. And listen, he became aware of what God was doing when he was praying. God showed him what he, what he was about to do. And I want to say to you, I think this is the most exciting thing in life about being a Christian, is that we can pray to God and that God's going to do something and somehow he's going to use peons like us. He's going to use me or you to accomplish his work, if, you, if you'll pray and seek him and ask. He'll show you. But if we don't pray, we're going to miss what God wants us to do. And he's going to miss what he would have us do. The enemy wants to frustrate and squelch prayer. Haven't you found that to be true? Isn't it hard to pray? Uh, I don't forget what Saint used to say. Satan will use adjusting a blind. Uh, you know, He'll turn your thought to that rather than give you the attention to pray. Whenever you want to pray, you're going to be distracted. You're going to say, oh, I, or you want to set aside a time, something's going to come up. I'm, it, trust me, it's just, that's the way it works. The battleground is prayer. But I just want to encourage you. Let's, let's, let's ask God even for help in praying. Lord, help me to pray. Westside Church needs a new senior pastor. We need to pray for that. Many of you probably are praying for that. Keep praying for that. If you're not praying for that, pray for that. There are people that need healing and God's grace to, to move forward. We need to pray for people and encourage people. You know, maybe you need encouragement. All I know is this God will move his powerful hand if we pray. He will. Many of you know Corey Temboom, who had. 
the Nazis for hiding Jews in her home in the Netherlands. She and her family were in prison, sent to concentration camps. All of her family died there. Uh, she alone escaped uh, due to a clerical error. She was released just uh, a few weeks before everybody that she had currently been living with went off uh, to the gas chambers. But she said this, listen to these quotes of her. She says, the more I pray, the more coincidences happen. <laughs> you know, the, I find the more I pray, oh, that, was that a coincidence? No, God doesn't. And is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? One's vital. You have to use it all the time if you're driving. The other one's just, in the case, ah, I get a flat, I need a, I need a spare. That encouraged me. One Sunday, I was preaching at Hope Church in Brunswick, and my brother-in-law, Jimmy, was there visiting. And I don't remember what I had preached about, but even before we began singing the closing song, I remember him leaving his seat and walking up and kneeling in front of the church. I think I have a picture of it. <clears throat> you can see on the left there, I, I thank my percussion player who just happened to take a picture from, from the drums there. And uh, it's just so precious to me. And when uh, the service ended, I just invited him up onto the platform next to me. That's the other picture. And I had him pray for us. I was never ashamed to have Jimmy pray. I was never worried about what he would say. I was never worried that, well, maybe it's not going to make any sense. Maybe, maybe he'll say something off the wall, like the one time when the, the Browns were playing the Denver Broncos for the AFC Championship years ago, you know, the drive and the fumble. It was one of those games, and uh, the pastor at his church gave the benediction, and, and just before they dismissed the people, this voice from the back said, Go Browns! It was my brother-in-law, Jimmy. <laughs> So you never knew exactly what he was going to say, but it was, it was so precious, and he just prayed a very simple prayer. And God, help my brother, help Hope Church. Never give up praying. Don't be so sophisticated. Don't be too proud. Don't be too self-sufficient that you don't pray to God. And he will see your prayer and the humility of your heart and he will answer you. I don't know the timing of that. We know that. We, we, we get frustrated sometimes. We pray for things that doesn't happen. And, but didn't Jesus encourage us that way? He told a parable about the persistent widow and the unjust judge. And the whole purpose of it was, he said, we ought always to pray and not lose heart. We ought always to pray you know, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. So he's going to move quickly, but it's his perspective that it moves quickly. Sometimes from our perspective, it's very slow. But keep praying, keep seeking. God wants to help us, and he's going to do it through the foundation of prayer. Uh, I wonder if we could even just for a few moments as we close, just be humble enough just to pray and ask God for his help. And I, rather than maybe just do that silently, if a, if a few of you would just want to pray this morning, and I, I'm thinking more collectively for our church family and for the needs of Westside Church and for our neighborhood. There's people who need to know his love. And I believe there's Corneliuses out there. Do you? Do you believe there's Corneliuses out in this neighborhood? Some that God's already working on. He's already stirring their hearts. Maybe they're even praying. Maybe there's a neighbor just down the street that says, God, I don't, if you're there, would you help me? And maybe he's going to connect you with them, just like he connected Peter and Cornelius. Does God still do that? Why not? Why wouldn't he do that? Why don't we ask him today? So please don't feel like you have to pray like a very pastoral, super spiritual prayer. Just pray from your heart today. What would you want for Westside Church? What would you want God to do?
If you'd so choose, I won't belabor this, we won't take a lot of time, but can we take a few moments as we close the service and just say, God, help me, help our church. Just pray as you feel led, and don't be embarrassed about it. Let's pray to him, let's seek him.
Let's stand together. Let's stand. God has heard even the prayers that were not spoken aloud. But uh, I'm not going to do either one of those songs, so you don't have to put them up there. Uh, let's just sing a couple uh, choruses together that we all know. Sing this with me. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. Sing it one I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to. his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up the, his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you guys. Good being with you. Let's keep praying. God bless.